Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Henry Schein Dental Academy webinar series. My name is Adam, Marketing Specialist, and I'll be your moderator. We're excited to welcome Dr. Bethany Valahi as our speaker today, as she will provide insights and techniques on how to avoid chronic back pain. Before we get started, we have a few reminders for you. At any point during the webinar, if you have questions, please type them into the Q&A section of your control panel, and we'll answer them live at the end of the webinar. And Henry Schein is not offering CE credit for viewing or attending this presentation live or on demand. Dr. Valahi, thanks for being with us. Thank you, Adam. It's a pleasure to be here. And thank you for joining me, everyone. Um, my background in dentistry started when I married a dentist with severe low back pain. And at the age of 35, my husband was forced to consider selling his dental practice due to severe low back pain. We would try all of the physical therapy techniques and exercises and modalities, but he'd go to the operatory and his pain would always return. So I went into the operatory, I did ergonomic modifications, adjusted his uh, loops, his stool, his operatory layout. Finally, his pain permanently resolved. So we realized this is where the intervention really needs to start is with ergonomics. So um, this led me on a whole different uh, career course. And today I teach ergonomics at OHSU School of Dentistry and I lecture internationally. So this has been a really fun um, course of study for me and I'd like to share some of that with you today. So when we look at the prevalence of pain among team members, we see that the most per, uh, common uh, low back pain is experienced among assistants due to their positioning challenges chair side. Um, we also see the highest neck and shoulder pre pain prevalence among hygienists and among dentists, the combination of all three low back, neck and shoulder pain. Now, even among the specialists, we see a predisposition to certain pain syndromes. Among the orthodontists, we see much more um, back pain. Among pedodontists, more neck pain. Among endodontists, shoulder and arm pain. And among uh, oral surgeons, leg pain and periodontists, neck and arm pain. So think about this. If you have a patient and they're not experiencing pain right at the moment, does that mean there's no structural problem? Well, of course it doesn't, right? You know that structural damage can be occurring for months or even years before you ever have the painful episode, right? And you teach this to your patients on a daily basis. You teach them they can in implement prevention strategies, brush, floss, have regular exams, fluoride treatments, or they can wait for the painful episode after which time you know this can become a chronic problem or a career ending disability. So likewise, regarding your uh, musculoskeletal health, you have a choice to make. Do you implement uh, prevention strategies to ensure your investment in your career? Or do you um, wait for the painful episode uh, where this can become an acute problem um, or require pain meds or emergency treatment. So there's a real parallel here between what you advocate to your patients in terms of their management of their oral health care and the prevention strategy and your own management of your musculoskeletal health. So in order to better understand this problem of work-related pain in dentistry, we have to go back a few years. To Back in 1946, we saw a study was done that showed that two out of three dentists complained of low back pain. So what did they do in the 1960s? They sat them down, right? So did this solve the problem of work-related pain? No, the problem simply moved north, right? So in addition to 
uh, team members experiencing low back pain. Now team members began to experience pain in the upper back, neck, and shoulders. So this started a whole new paradigm of equipment uh, ranging from dental stools to delivery systems to loops, all of which play an important role in managing and preventing work-related pain. However, <clears throat> studies show that the prevalence of work-related pain today in dentistry is actually worse than it was 70 years ago. So what's going on with this? With all of our technology, technological advances and the equipment manufacturers, the research, all of this, the pain is getting worse. So let's take a look at why. One problem in the past has been that the problem of uh, work-related pain in dentistry, the etiology has not been properly identified. Doctors, would you even dream of treating your patient if you didn't understand the etiology of their pain problem? Of course not, right? Likewise, we need to understand the mechanisms that lead to work-related pain in dentistry before we can have an effective solution. So first and foremost, we have to identify the etiologies. Then we need to be applying evidence-based interventions, not hand-me-down solutions that have been done in the schools for decades. Um, uh, so we really need to be looking to the evidence here. Now, there, everyone has different risk factors, and some of these we have control over, some of these we don't have so much control over. So we've got things like the environment, um, COVID, right? <laughs> That's a big risk factor. Congenital risk factors, age, gender, which I guess you could affect that, but that would be another lecture entirely. And then we have things you can affect like body mechanics, your flexibility and um, strength. So everyone's risk factors are a little bit different here. And this is why some doctors will report, man, you know, I was, they're 75 years old and they're like, I never had work-related pain. Well, everybody's different, right? Some bodies are gonna be naturally um, more tolerant of some of these um, postures and positions. Now, the risk factors that we need to consider in the operatory are ones that you do have control over. So let's look at those. Prolonged static postures, mental stress, non-neutral postures, visual challenges, repetitive motions, and force. Now, in order to understand how these risk factors progress and end up in an injury, we need to understand how this progression happens in the operatory. So you've got your risk factors, these six risk factors in the operatory. This is your first line of defense, okay? I'm gonna repeat that because it's so important. We've got to be resolving ergonomics in the operatory first and foremost. Um, then, because dentistry is a very physically demanding career, we also need a second line of defense. So look at the next, you see physiological changes. So physiological changes start happening in the body. You have muscle ischemia from the prolonged static postures, trigger points, inflammation, muscle imbalances from positioning in to one side repeatedly and upregulated sympathetic nervous system, that flight, fight or flight response um, and this degeneration. So we need two points where we can implement prevention strategies. So the first one, the risk factors, the first picture here, this is your dental ergonomics. We have those, that is our first line of defense, but we also need to address physiological changes um, to prevent this from progressing to a pain syndrome. So this is my five steps to preventing practice, uh, preventing, <laughs> preventing work-related pain in dentistry. And this is what all of my video course education is built upon. As, um, so again, the first step 
is always dental ergonomics. I've seen a lot of money spent on personal trainers and gym subscriptions and massages and chiropractors only to, re to return to what caused the problem in the first place, which very often is poor ergonomics in the operatory. So we've got to address this first and foremost, otherwise you're just kind of spinning your wheels, right? So let's take a look at what is involved with looking at dental ergonomics. Now, dental ergonomics, when um, I lecture on dental ergonomics, this is a three hour course. So I have time today to share about 10, 10, 12 minutes of that with you. So I'm gonna take a deep dive into dental stools. So let's take a look at that. And we know that among the average population, about one in six people report that they had low back pain in the last 12 months. However, among dental professionals, that statistic is about one in two. So you're almost three times more prone to low back pain than the general population. That's significant. What do we see is causing low back pain in dentistry non-ergonomic operator stools or poor adjustment of the stool, which is just as important as the non-ergonomic operator stool. And then all these other risk factors that we, we're not gonna get in today, but poor body mechanics, in, improper patient positioning, especially for the upper arch, rheostat position, uh, specific um, muscle imbalances, stress, dura points. Now, with so many dental stools on the market, is it not the most confusing and frustrating thing to walk into an exhibit hall and look at all the stools? Everyone says that their stool is ergonomic. They do, right? All the vendors, our stool is the most ergonomic. How do you know? Okay, so let's look at the criteria for selecting a truly ergonomic stool. When we're, you're selecting a dental stool, we need to look at your gender because some stools are better suited to women than men. We need to look at your disc health um, because there are certain backrest adjustments that I would definitely want on someone with a herniated disc. Uh, uh, so body shape, uh, are you an ectomorph, mesomorph, or endomorph, or full-bodied? And um, that's dramatically going to impact which stool you get because they have different seat sizes and backrest shapes that are going to be better for some people than others. Here's one of the most important ones, lumbar curve. So uh, some people are more, have an excessive lumbar curve, other have a flattened lumbar curve. Your height how much room is available in the 12 o'clock position? So lots of things to consider here. So one thing that has caused a lot of problems in the past is non-tilting operator stools, because we know that this mechanism, this combination of sitting on a flat seat combined with leaning forward flattens your lumbar spine and it can and it causes the um, disc to protrude posteriorly which is a huge risk for disc herniation so i know a lot of dentists where you were taught in school or in hygienists maybe you were taught in school to sit with your thighs parallel to the floor so ask yourself why were you taught to sit with thighs parallel to the floor if anyone knows, email me because I've been researching for 20 years. All the research on seated biomechanics does not point to sitting with thighs parallel to the floor. So that is a head scratcher for sure. So the seat pan directly impacts your lumbar posture. When you sit on a flat seat, it causes flattening of the lumbar spine and causes the disc to go backwards, setting the stage for back pain and disc herniation. A lot of you go, yeah, a lot of you are thinking, you know, well, I know that that's not the right way to sit, you know, round, having a rounded back. So I perch on the edge of my seat, right? And you're like, 
this looks good. I have a low back curve. Here's the problem. When you're perching on the edge of your seat, yes, you have a nice low back curve, but the muscles that are constantly having to contract to hold you in that position aren't designed to contract all day long. So by late morning, early afternoon, here you are again with a flattened, rounded low back. So an easier way to um, maintain that lumbar curve without force and without thinking about it is with an inclined seat pan. So let's look at this. Now, when you have, a lot of you probably have a uh, traditional stool with a tilting seat in your operatory. Now, I actually used to teach because there weren't, there were, there used to not be uh, saddle stools available. And I used to teach just sitting with, with the seat tilted downward because this does help promote the lumbar curve. However, more recent research shows that even with the seat tilted like 15 degrees down, it's still not enough to maintain your low back curve unless you're in contact with the backrest. So ask yourself now here, honestly, how much of my dental treatment time am I actually in contact with the backrest? And if you're like most people, it's maybe 10%, 20%, okay? So that is the problem is that it's not enough. If you tilt it more than that, you're on the floor, right? You slide on the floor. So um, it's just not enough unless you're in constant contact with the backrest. Um, most operators can't do that. So saddle, saddle stools have become all the rage in dentistry and for good reason. Because when you are sitting on a saddle stool, um, it opens your hip angle much larger. So you're kind of halfway between standing and sitting. So when you're sitting on a saddle stool, think of supported standing and you get a better idea of the position of your pelvis. Because the, the position of your pelvis here is exactly the same on a saddle stool as when you're standing which is why most people don't need a backrest if they on a saddle stool because the they're already in the pelvis is already neutral. It's like why would you need a backrest when you're standing? Because your your pelvis is in a neutral position. So the saddle because you have this large hip angle, you get closer proximity to the oral cavity, it's much easier to move around the patient easily, very easy to get into a tight 12 o'clock position. Sometimes the saddle stool can resolve low back, hip, and sciatic pain. However, probably about a quarter of the people that I have seen by saddle stools, it causes low back pain. Let's talk about why. Some people have altered lumbar curves. Some have hyper lordosis, which is an excessive curvature of the low back. Some have hypo lordosis. So this is going to dramatically impact what type of dental stool you get because you don't want this to get worse, right? If this gets worse, it can cause spondylosis or um, spondylolisthesis. This can cause a herniated disc. We don't want this to get worse. So if you'd like, take a moment here and you can do this little um, posture wall test against a wall. So I'm gonna um, just go very slowly here so you can all stand up, find a wall to go to and do this little test to determine if you have uh, a tendency toward hyperlordosis or hypolordosis. You're gonna put your heels about two to three inches from the wall like this picture here and you're buttocks, your shoulders, and your head all have to be touching the wall. Okay, you got it? Now you're going to take your hand and you're going to slide it behind your back, between your back and the wall. If you can only get the first few fingers in, 
you're probably hypo lordotic or have a flattened low back curve. If you can get the whole hand in easily, that's pretty normal. That's a neutral lumbar curve. If you can slide your whole arm behind you, that's hyper, probably hyper lordosis. So take a note of which, where you lie on that um, lumbar curve um, tendency, because now we're going to talk about two different styles of saddle stools. So you have the true style of saddle stool, which is just like you know, sitting on a, it feels like sitting on a horse. Um, this one has a backrest. Um, you can have that or you don't have to have it. However, if I had a flattened lumbar curve, um, I would definitely uh, recommend the um, backrest to promote curvature here and not let it worsen. Now, and if you were somebody who just had a neutral spine, I would say that a true saddle stool would be, um, fine as well. Now there's another type of saddle stool called a hybrid saddle stool. Notice how this puts you in the exact same position as a true saddle stool, except it has a different shape. So you're sitting on a flat seat, not a saddle seat, but it has cutouts here where, where your thighs are. So you can get that angle of the thighs going down. It has a little less groin compression. So some men like it, maybe a little better than the saddle stool. Um, but if you have hyperlordosis, um, this is a stool that would be much better than a traditional saddle stool for you. So um, both of these um, are examples from crown seating. Now, that is just one uh, factor influencing your stool selection. Now, once you have the stool, it's equally as important to know how to adjust it based on your hyperlordosis or hypolordosis. Um, you need to be selecting your stool based on your body type. Do you have, do you need armrest? There's five cases where I consider armrest mandatory for dental professionals. Which one is better? What is the stool better for a woman or a man? The disc health, how you would adjust this if you did have a disc problem and your height. This is hugely important for selecting stools. Some of these are not appropriate for different heights of operators. So um, if you're interested in continuing um, this education, I do have a, a course um, on the website, Dental Stools on Low Back Pain. We go into all the therapies and the re latest research and specific exercise in, and how to adjust the stool that uh, would be best for you as well as just selecting it because the adjustment is just as important. Now, Step two, stress management. Have we not all gotten a big dose of stress since the COVID pandemic? So the reason, this is step number two, is that <clears throat> studies show that um, stress tends to cause, set the stage and cause the formation of trigger points and tight muscles. So when you are stressed out, it's going to be much more challenging to resolve your own trigger points or for a massage therapist to resolve your trigger points. And the effectiveness isn't going to be uh, as long duration when uh, you're under stress. So we want, that's why this is step number two, very important that you're down regulating the sympathetic nervous system uh, before you're treating your trigger points or chair side stretching. We know that dentistry is stressful. This is not a news flash, okay? So over 50% of dentists report um, high job stress. The problem here is this can lead to burnout and diminished uh, professional standards. So a 2016 wellness survey done by the ADA found that two out of three dentists perceived stress at their work. And that's not surprising right? Dentistry is stressful. But the more interesting statistic here was that when they asked if pain interfered with their work, 
two, almost the same, about 63% said that that had um, pain, moderate pain, that pain interfered with their work. So there's a real correlation here between stress and pain. It's very real. Now, you probably have experienced the fight or flight response many times in your, in your life. Probably not due to this, but um, but it uh, sets it's um, it has the same reaction in your body to a lesser degree. Your adrenaline increases. Your blood gets shunted to the larger mover muscles in anticipation of escaping. Right, breathing increases. Heart rate, blood pressure, all increase in anticipation of the life-threatening event right? The problem here is that our brains are hardwired for survival. They're hardwired for survival, which means it has the same response to this as to stress in the operatory. So this is why we need to get a handle on the stress response. So um, low back pain, in particular, was found in studies to be correlated with interpersonal conflict, which is really interesting and is really applicable, isn't it, in the dental office. So poor communication increases low back pain. So here are some strategies that we can uh, use in the operatory or in the office. Um, monitoring your tone of voice. A lot of times we don't realize that our voice is coming across a certain way. I'm reminded of this often by my husband. <laughs> He's like, don't use that tone with me. So we, sometimes we don't realize it. So just be an observer, observe yourself and monitor your tone of voice. Now, second, eliminate sentences starting with you. And many of you have heard this, right? Counselors use this all the time in, in uh, marriage counseling, right? Don't say you, 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 you know, rephrase it with, I heard you say blah, blah, blah. So that's a good reminder. Don't assume, right? Trying to figure out what others need. Ask them what they need. So this can be, um, yeah, I just had a, a huge um, work incident with this in my own office where my assistant did not ask me what I wanted to do with year end and proceeded to close out year end improperly and lost three years of data. And we did end up restoring it, but it, it's going to take many days to re-enter all the data. Anyway, um, ask. <laughs> I cannot, as an employer, it's so important um, to have the team communicate and ask what you need not to assume. Can we revisit this later? Sometimes in um, the operatory, it's not a good time. And um, timing is everything, right? If you know someone's in a bad mood, if, if the doctor just had a bad experience with a patient, now's not the good, a good time to talk. So maybe instead of um, being reactive, saying, can we revisit this later? Now's not a good time. Lastly, good communication with patients is just as good as important with the team. So remember that all those strategies that you learn um, in your um, practice management, you know, gurus that come in and teach you this stuff, remember it's just as important with the patient as well. And module three, um, step number three. The reason this says modules is because this is all based on my uh, the, something called the well body system, which is my entire, um, all my video courses um, packed together into one, uh, one system. So 
module three or step three is myofascial treatment. The reason that this is step number th three is that if we exercise muscles that have active trigger points, your pain can actually get worse. Many of you have experienced this, right? You go to the gym, you think that this is going to be a good idea to you know, help control your pain and it actually backfires and makes it worse. Very often this is why. Now some um, myofascia, what is this? So, if you prepare chicken or turkey, um, you lift up the skin and you stuff all the goodies, the herbs and the butter and stuff under the skin to make it really delicious. All of that gooey, webby stuff that's under the skin, it's between the skin and the muscle, is the myofascia. It's kind of gelatinous, web-like, gooey stuff. Okay, that's the myofascia. Now, with muscle overuse, which happens a lot in dentistry, combined with dehydration, the fascia and the muscle get trapped together. And you can imagine that's pretty painful. And you, you felt this when you get a massage, right? We, um, some areas are really, really tight. And it's because of the adhering of the um, skin and the, the fascia and the muscle together getting trapped. You saw this for yourself in cadaver lab, right? When you went to lift up the skin and it didn't come up so easily, did it? You kind of had to really pick away the dried up fascia there in order to separate the muscle from the skin. So when the fascia becomes stiff and dehydrated, it's really difficult to get back to its gel-like flexible state without physical intervention. So this is why pain meds don't work on trigger points and why, um, yeah, bio biofeedback and mindfulness, all that stuff, it doesn't work on trigger points. You have to have physical intervention. Now, a trigger point defined is just kind of a hyper irritable knot that develops in your skeletal muscle. It hurts when you press on it, but a unique characteristic of a trigger point is that when you press on it, it can refer pain to distance areas of the body, which is a really bizarre and unique characteristic of trigger points. And if you looked at one trigger point under a microscope, what you'd see is many, many myofibrils contracting that comprise this trigger point that you feel under your finger. Now, a few trigger points here and there is just kind of annoying. However, when you get a whole series of them and they're really bad, that's called a myofascial pain syndrome. And the reason we see so many dental professionals with myofascial pain syndrome is because the risk factors here are asymmetrical postures, mental stress, and muscle ischemia. Okay, asymmetrical postures, mental stress, and muscle ischemia. So you can imagine this really um, sets the stage for trigger points to develop in team members. So let's see if you have trigger points. So let's go down this little list. Do you have sore spots in your muscles? You can press and it makes it sore. Um, does pain usually occur in certain areas of your body? Is the pain kind of a dull, aching, nagging kind of pain? Do you feel a lot of stiffness when you move? Are the affected areas kind of weak and heavy? Does stretching sound look like a good idea, but when you do it, it doesn't really help that pain area. Hot showers and baths typically do help a little. And anti-inflammatories meds absolutely do not work. So um, I teach 
seven key trigger points that dental professionals are prone to that are really tend to be uh, problematic in team members. And because we're talking about the low back here, this was the closest of the seven trigger points I could get to the low back. So it's the piriformis trigger point. And this one refers in the uh, down into the buttock and the risk factor here is from prolonged sitting or driving. So when we look at this diagram here, we see the little X's. Those are where the trigger points are located. Where you see the red area is the referred pain. So you can see for this trigger point, kind of the lateral one, that it's out almost to the lateral hip, but it goes all the way down the back of the leg. So that's what I mean by referral. A lot of these trigger points, um, they the trigger point that's causing the problem very often isn't in the same area where you're having the pain. And that's why Western medicine doctors can just send you round and round and round on a wild goose chase with your pain patterns until, um, because they're not trained in uh, trigger point therapy and there is no ICD-9 code for trigger points. So they get no label, they don't get reimbursed by insurance and you, you're tearing your hair out, right? So the way that we treat these trigger points, and I, this again, this is another one hour course is the teaching, treating the seven key trigger points. Um, it's a protocol um, shown in research to be the most effective where you start with either heat or ice and you choose one of four different tools you compress it and vibrate it and you go back and forth between these two techniques. It's a very light technique, um, no more than one minute per trigger point. And then you perform a very specific stretch depending on what trigger point that you're treating. So um, there's, uh, again, there's more information on the website if you're interested in taking a deep dive into trigger points. Um, into self-treating your trigger points. Chair side stretching is number four. The reason this is before strengthening is because we know the muscle has to have full range of motion before you begin strengthening. And this is um, very common knowledge among, among most personal trainers, PTs, doctors know this as well. So chair side stretching addresses all the microtrauma resulting from prolonged static postures. It reverses your favorite worst positions, right? Tight muscles are targeted in very specific stretches. You can perform the chair, them chair side, but you can also perform them at home. Um, when you're sitting watching TV is a great time to um, perform these. And it's also a great time to treat your trigger points as well. Studies show that a frequent series of short stretches is much more beneficial than a less frequent series of longer stretch breaks. What I mean by this is that a 10 second stretch done every 40 minutes, studies show is more effective than a two minute break done every two hours, okay? So I want you to try this. So I want you to bring the right arm across the front, left wrist underneath, and then very slowly look over your right shoulder. And I want you to observe where the chin is in relation to your shoulder, okay? Now, breathe in and exhale, and you're gonna hold this for two to four breath cycles. You're never going into the pain with chair side stretching. Okay, never go into the pain. If it's painful, back off a little. Now compare this with the other side. Are you able to turn your head as far in this direction? Where's your chin in relation to your shoulder in this direction? Now, if most dental professionals find that they're tighter on one side than the other, and if you're like my dental students, um, I, I think I asked my DS2 students to do this little exercise and about three quarters of them 
we're already tighter on one side than the other. So can you imagine then if this starts in dental and hygiene school, this you this tight unilateral tightness, if you don't address this after 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, is it any wonder that uh, um, injuries and pain develop? So we already talked about this. Um, so what direction should you be stretching toward during the workday, toward the tightest side, right? At home and the weekends, you can stretch in both directions. But I want you to really think about this. You're going to be stretching in both directions in, or excuse me, you're only going to be stretching toward the tightest side um, in the operatory. So you can, let's try this, uh, this one as well. This is a low back one. This is a stretch that I developed based on two different dental studies. One was a study from Sweden that showed that uh, dentists had less flexibility rotating away from the patient. The other was a study that showed that a right-handed dentist tended to go into this position, leaning forward and to the right, um, two thirds of the time. So that all resulted in this stretch. So leaning, when you do this stretch, make sure that you lean all your body weight through your left knee. You shouldn't be holding yourself up at all. So you're starting with this. You're starting here, resting your elbow on your knee, and then you're bringing your right arm overhead. So you're getting a nice um, latissimus dorsi stretch as well as lumbar stretch. Hold it for two to four breath cycles. And then you can try this on the other side as well if you'd like to. Now the last step in preventing work-related pain in dentistry is muscular endurance training. And you're thinking, why would that be last? There, are, there was so much research um, when, I, when I started developing this program on this topic of muscular endurance training for dental professionals um, over strengthening or weight training. So tell you more about this. Dental professionals are prone to a unique muscle imbalance that's caused by forward head and rounded shoulder posture. So uh, unlike any other occupation. So these are your primary shoulder girdle stabilizers, your middle and lower trapezius muscles. Now these muscles must be, um, must be properly trained for endurance if you're going to sit with good posture all day without pain and without fatigue. If these muscles aren't properly targeted, other muscles take over and have to compensate and do their job. Many of you will recognize these from massages, right? The massage therapist is saying, oh, that upper trapezius is really tight again, or the upper rhomboids or the levator scapula. Meanwhile, up front, you've got the pectoralis major, his tight, the sternocleidomastoid. So what do we want to be doing for the tight muscles on the right side of the screen? Exactly. You want to be stretching them, right? Now, what do you want to be doing for the weak muscles on the left side of the screen? Strengthening, right? What happens when you hire a personal trainer or you embark on a generic exercise program like Pilates or P90X or CrossFit? What happens when you embark in those which always, always include strengthening of these weak ischemic muscles? So what happens? when you strengthen tight, short, painful ischemic muscles, your pain gets worse, right? So doing overhead presses, rows, bench presses, okay? 
not a problem for the general public, right? So this is just one example of one of the muscle imbalances team members are prone to, but this can throw you into the vicious pain cycle. So um, this happens a lot. Here's an example of the lower trapezius strengthening exercise. And you can see how much fun it is, right? <laughs> And then here's not such a good idea, the vertical row, which is strengthens the upper traps, which we don't want to do. Now, there's two groups of muscles in your body. you got your mover muscles, you got your postural muscles. Which ones do you want to be strengthening? Your postural, right? So how should you be strengthening those for endurance or for power and strength? And when, before you answer, think, what do I ask my muscles to do all day in the operatory? You're asking them to contract for a long period of time at a very low level, right? So you're asking them to be endurance muscles. That's what we need to train these muscles for, right? Now, the, the prevalence of the research for, then the, the research that supports muscular endurance training for dental professionals is really, really, um, there is a lot of it out there. So I'm going to read one quote here, and this is by a study done in Finland. And he says, lack of muscular strength is seldom a critical factor, even among female dentists, while greater muscle strength may protect against overstrain in occupations where greater external forces are frequently applied. It does not seem to protect against symptoms caused by static postural loads. Another study found that dentists with better endurance of the back and shoulder muscles have less pain. Another found female dentists with poor endurance of the shoulder muscles have more neck and shoulder pain. So again, this theme of endurance kept coming back and back in the literature. Now, muscular endurance training is essential in dentistry for preventing neck and back pain, period. It targets deep postural stabilizers, essential for preventing injuries, allows you to work longer, more comfortably. So we do this with high repetitions and low resistance and little recovery time between the sets. Now, if you Googled the words muscular endurance training on the internet, you would get a lot of the wrong exercises for dental professionals because it's not specific to dentistry. I, I Googled muscular endurance training and I got um, bench presses and I got military presses and I'm like, oh my gosh, we need to be clear here that these have to be really specific based on your unique pattern of muscle imbalances. So there are six postural stabilizers, three scapular muscles and three rotator cuff, rotator cuff muscles that need to be addressed. You should be able to do all of this in 25 minutes. So what I did with my home exercise program is put all of these muscles together in um, a few exercises. So you wouldn't have to spend an hour and a half doing all the, uh, exercising all the muscles. This is one um, exercise from the video course. So I'm just gonna play it for you. Position yourself on hands and knees over the ball with your chin slightly tucked. Contract the lower abdominals and pull your navel up towards your spine. Hold this contraction throughout the exercise. Make sure your back is flat and hips are level. Slowly lift the right arm, thumb pointing up, hold. Then slowly lower it. Slowly lift the other arm, hold. Then lower. Remember to continue breathing. Now lift the right leg, hold. and lower. Repeat for the left leg. Make sure your pelvis stays level and does not rock back and forth as you lift your legs. Continue to perform five lifts for each arm. And okay, so um, the advanced version of that is opposite arm and opposite leg. So as you saw in the picture. 
So there's a lot of exercises that can worsen the health of dental professionals. So I'm offering you here a little webinar bonus because I've got 12 hours of education and we only had 45 minutes here today. So um, if you're interested in my ebook, um, a video that improves your head posture in the operatory by 15 degrees, no matter what type of loops you wear, the, my white paper with 14 exercises dental professionals should avoid, um, an ergonomic checklist. Um, you can take your phone and text 4455-55444 and enter the word wellness, or you can just go to this website. So you can just take, or if you want, you can take a picture of this and um, uh, to have uh, to enter all that information later on. Now, if you are interested in continuing your education, these are one hour video courses that take a deep dive into, I've got uh, eight of them on the website. These are just a few examples. Um, dentistry shouldn't be a pain in the neck. Uh, the home exercise program, all 24 exercises, my 10 step patient positioning um, for difficult patients and uh, treating the seven key trigger points and there's many more. So you get CE credits, I'm AGD PACE approved. Uh, you get 50% off with this discount code. So when I first became a PT, I found I had very two different groups of people. I had the all fix me's and I had the you fix me's, right? And you know who these people are. You get these in your office all the time. So the you fix me's would I say, hey, how'd your week go? Did you do your exercises? Did you make your workplace modifications? And they would say, Oh, you know, that was really, it really had a tough week, but you know, that massage you did last week, that felt really good. Boom, down they go on the table. Well, the I'll fix me's came in, they had done their exercises, made their workplace modifications and taken control of their musculoskeletal health. So I hope now I've given you some resources here to begin your journey to being pain-free. It is possible. And um, keep in mind that only you can prevent your pain. Thanks very much. And let's go to some questions. Oh, first, I want to remind you of Thrive Live. This is coming up May 21st. I'm doing a 20 minutes, a 20 minute segment on patient positioning. Okay. So we're taking a, it's a section from that video course. So 20 minutes on patient positioning, difficult patients, all of that. So let's go to the Q and A and see what questions we might have. What are your thoughts on the yoga wheel for back stretches? The yoga wheel? I don't even know what that is, sorry. What is the opinion of ball type chairs? So that's a great question. Tom, Wichita, nice to see you. Um, so ball chairs, what we found when we evaluated these, and ball, um, for, for those of you who don't know what we're talking about, you put a ball on a frame of a chair frame, and sometimes they have a backrest as well. So it's an exercise ball, basically, that you're sitting on. And that's, that's good. Um, they, they work especially well for shorter dentists and hygienists. The reason for that is um, when we added the extensions to them for people that were like five foot eight and taller, they were ended up with thighs parallel to the floor. So um, that's a instant fail in my book. You've got to have thighs sloping steeply downward. Um, and the other problem is in a lot of operatories, we couldn't get that big exercise ball into the 12 o'clock position. Once again, that's an instant fail in my book. Um, tell Keith, hi, I sure will, Tom. It's, it's great to virtually see you. Um, surely there's more here. Is this all the, is that all the questions? No, we've got questions. I'll, I'll ask you some. Oh, wait, chat. Um, I see. Never mind. I, I had the wrong screen open here. Okay. <laughs> all right. I see now. All right. Do you know the Merida chair? Yes. So it had all the hand pieces and sections built right into it. Rick, join me on May 21st or 
look at my pay, my positioning for success in dentistry. With the Merida chair, you are in a very supine position. There's not a lot of ability to control the occlusal plane. So think about that. Once you've watched my um, positioning for success, one hour CE course, um, I think that'll answer your question. Oops, sorry, I'm clicking on the wrong thing here. Um, do you feel regular massage is helpful? Absolutely. Um, uh, in the prevention of chronic pain, absolutely. It addresses so many um, important uh, factors that lead to work-related pain, the ischemia, um, make sure that your person is trigger point trained. Um, if you don't know if your person is trigger point trained, you really have to ask them a certain question. And the question is, just one moment. If you ask a, a massage therapist, do you treat trigger points? 99% of them are going to say, oh, yeah. Yeah, I treat trigger points. Um, ask them, do you have Dr. Travell's big red book? Because Dr. Travell wrote the Bible on trigger points. If they don't have Dr. Travell's big red book in their um, office, they're probably not a trigger point therapist. All right, so that's your screening question. Um, are the exercise workout videos on your website? Yes. Go to Posturedonics. They're under shop and you can get the 50% discount. Thoughts on the saddle chair. Okay. That must've been before I talked about them. Any particular type of chair for pregnant dentists? Yeah. So the saddle chair works well for pregnancy. However, a lot of times pregnant, pregnant dentists are hyper lordotic and that's going to put you in more hyperlordosis. So then um, the dental stools and low back pain course would be a good one for um, taking a deeper dive on that because you've got a lot of issues to address there. Your views about back shoulder brace for posture correction. That's a great question. Back and shoulder braces for posture correction. That's great for temporary use. So if you have had pain and you're just wanting some extra support to help those muscles heal, that's great for temporary use. Um, or if you're using them, maybe you want to use them for a root canal during a long, uh, a long procedure. Um, the problem is you can't use them all the time or they will substitute for your postural muscles and then you make yourself more prone to pain and injury whenever you don't wear it. So it can't be a substitute for correct muscular endurance um, exercise. Can you talk a little about loops ergonomics? Um, that's a one hour <laughs> topic, Debbie. I can talk about, yeah, I'll, just real briefly. Um, I have seen loop, uh, well-designed ergonomic loops prevent, reverse, and completely eliminate neck pain. I have also seen non-ergonomic loops create neck pain where there was no neck pain before and um, worsen neck pain. So there are three criteria I teach in the um, dentistry shouldn't be a pain in the neck course that uh, where you can, um, you'll learn how to select the right loops. You'll learn how to make corrections to the through the lens loops you already own. Um, so maybe you don't even need to buy new loops. So it shows four ways to make modifications to the TTOs you already have to get it make them more ergonomic. Um, and let's see others. I, our chiropractors, a first line of treatment for lower back pain. Um, so Todd, this is a great question. Um, think about, and again, this is such a short course. Again, when I do my full day, uh, full day course, I talk about the mechanisms that lead to pain in dentistry. And one of the biggest contributors is muscle imbalance. So right-handed dentists tend to lead more to one side than the other. Over time, they develop 
uh, muscles that are shortened and tightened on one side, longer on the other side. It feels good to have that put it back into adjustment by your chiropractor, but does that solve the underlying problem? No. So um, I hope that answers your question. So I that is module three. I teach um, specific um, treatments. What the research shows is most effective for neck pain, low back pain, shoulder pain, and all of that. In um, the treatment, treat your pain, treat and beat your myofascial pain, I guess is what it's called. Um, do you recommend any type of lumbar support for your car? Yes, there's a great one made by BQE Ergonomics, Back Quality Ergonomics. They make a great, um, it's just the right size. It's kind of like the Goldilocks of back pains. Floating armrests, um, I found for most general dentists, they like the 2D telescoping armrests better than the... Um, than the uh, floating. Was forced to learn as a righty when my natural hand is my left. This is very difficult for me. Yeah, that, that, is, that is tough. It, it is difficult that, I mean, and kudos to you for even learning <laughs> how to do dentistry as a righty when your uh, dominant hand is your left. So actually that's really good, Rick, because this can perhaps, if you could go either way and, you know, work on one side, if you have a, um, what is it? An over the patient delivery that could go to either side of the patient, right? If you could work part of the time on the right, part of the time on the left, that's a pretty ideal situation um, for Right-handed dentists, a lot of times if they injure the right hand, they have to start doing things like extractions with their left hand and they find that it wasn't as hard as they thought to learn how to um, control that non-dominant hand. So gyrotonic, um, no comment, went to the Baltimore Human Performance Institute with a Morita chair. Okay. Yes, Dr. Trevell, cold spray and stretch. Yes. Chairs with armrests, who benefits? Chairs with armrests, um, five populations that I consider armrests mandatory for. Endodontists, um, people with short forearms. So if your short arms are short from here to here, you are forced to reach forward further than someone with longer forearms, right? And that creates pain in the upper back and neck. Um, and, and pregnant women and women with large chests, okay? Is sciatica different from muscle pain? Yes, sciatica is nerve pain and sciatica is sharp shooting pain, which is very different than muscle pain, which is a dull throbbing pain. So we didn't really talk about that with piriformis syndrome, um, but it, it's, that is all in my uh, module three video course on piriformis and sciatica. Why would orthodontists have the most back pain? You know why I think this, and I, I don't know this for a fact because this was not in the study, but from 20 years of consulting with orthodontists, I think that one of the issues is that a lot of them aren't wearing loops because they, they see, they want to see more of the whole mouth. Um, and a lot of these ortho and pedo chairs, pa the patient chairs themselves are non-adjustable heights, if you can believe it, they are. So certain companies sell these non-adjustable height chairs and orthodontists end up having to lean over. So that's uh, also contributed a, a, in a big way to that problem. Um, yeah, that's just my opinion, so. Thanks for joining me and everyone have a great 2021. I look forward to seeing you on May 21st at. Thrive Live, practice in good health. Awesome. Well, thank you, Dr. Valahi, for the great presentation and certainly making my job easier tonight. Uh, if anyone is interested in attending future Henry Shine webinars, visit henryshinedental.com slash webinars for our upcoming schedule. 
As a thank you for attending, everyone will receive this recording via email sometime in the next week. So keep your eyes out for that. I'd like to thank you all for joining us and we hope to see you back here soon. Have a great night.